Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Mitchell, and I'm the chairman of Earth Secretariat. The Earth standing for International Religious Freedom, of course. Uh, but thank you so much, Katrina, and thanks to you and Ambassador Sam Brownback for serving as co-chairs once again and for spending so much of your time and effort to pull this all together. Uh, please give, me a, give a round of applause to our co-chairs. And as chairman of Earth Secretariat, which is the legal entity host and title partner, welcome to Earth Summit 2022. And welcome to the Civil Society Congress. It's only fitting that this is the opening session of this year's summit, which is a civil society-led summit. As you know, the ministerials to advance religious freedom started in 2018, and they are government-led, organized, and funded. This summit was started by Ambassador Brown back last year as the premier civil society gathering. And it's self-organized and self-funded by dozens of convening partners from civil society. So its, its success is made possible by each and every one of you. So I want to thank you all for your leadership and give yourselves a round of applause. And as with the summit, the growing global movement will succeed because of you. That's why we invited you all to submit and make opening statements that contain innovative solutions for the global movement to advance religious freedom for everyone, everywhere, all the time. Why do we need innovative solutions? Put simply, there has never been more advocacy and government actions to advance religious freedom, yet persecution has never been worse. Despite 20 plus years of increasing civil society advocacy and government actions, going back to the passage of the International Religious Freedom Act in 1998, and the creation of the IRF office at the State Department, and the IRF ambassador, the annual reports, and USERF, and other countries that have since followed suit with their own ambassadors and special envoys, and the Earth Roundtables and other civil society networks and the ministerials. Despite all of that, the Pew Research Center still reports that roughly 80% of the world's population lives in countries with high or very high levels of overall restrictions on religion. So traditional advocacy by itself has proven to be insufficient to reduce persecution and social hostilities. We've done, we're all doing tremendous work, but what else do we need to be doing? What else can we do? It's up to us to innovate. As former Ambassador Robert Seipel once told me when I asked him a question about how can we get governments to, to do more on this, he said, don't wait for governments. Don't rely on governments. Work, you know, we can work with governments whenever possible, but it's up to us. We have to take the lead. We have to show the way forward and hold government's feet to the fire. But why? Why is this important? For that, I want to introduce one of the first leaders of the IRF movement. Tom Farr is the president of the Religious Freedom Institute and the, the director of its Earth Policy Action Team. He's a leading authority on religious freedom. He served for 28 years in the Army and the US Foreign Service. He was the first director of the IRF office at the State Department when IRFA passed in 1998. He directed the Witherspoon Institute's IRF task force. He, taught, he's, he served on the Secretary of State's IRF working group. He directed the Religious Freedom Project at Georgetown's Berkeley Center. And he has published many works, including a book that shaped US religious freedom legislation and foreign policy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to introduce Tom Farr. Thank you, Greg. It's an honor to be here with you, and it's an honor to have been asked to frame the issue for this summit. So I'm going to do that by engaging a foundational question. Why is religious freedom important for everyone everywhere? And perhaps more to the point, why should you and I, regardless of our political or religious beliefs, support religious freedom for everyone everywhere? Now, I'm going to give you my answer, drawing on my own Catholic tradition and on the American founders. I hope you see your own views represented in what I have to say. Religious freedom is important because human beings must have the freedom to be religious. Religion is the natural, powerful quest by every human conscience to determine whether there's a greater than human source of our existence, our being, 
of ultimate meaning and of true happiness in this life, and if there is one, in the next. To deny any human being the freedom to conduct this search and to live in accord with the truths he or she discovers is to attack the very core of human dignity, the very heart of what it means to be human. Freedom of religion is therefore not a privilege granted by government. It's a natural, inalienable right given to every human being by God. It's the duty and the right of conscience to discern the truth about religion and to exercise religion, alone or with others, in private and in public. Religious freedom by its nature excludes compulsion. No person may be compelled or manipulated by any human agent, especially government, to seek God or to worship him. God himself neither compels nor manipulates. He loves and he beckons. We should imitate him. This view of religious freedom and human dignity is for me a source of extraordinary inspiration. It motivates me to fight for the religious freedom of every human being, and I hope it does you too. And in fact, this noble idea, religious freedom as human dignity, is so compelling that it's been affirmed many times in the modern world, in international covenants, national constitutions, statutes, books by scholars, speeches by government officials, uh, and by politicians. And yet, millions of our fellow human beings remain subject to violent, sometimes deadly religious persecution, or to invidious religious discrimination. They are real human beings, these millions, real families, real communities of people who are praying, paying a profound cost for their religious consciences. We mustn't forget them, we must listen to them, we must fight for them. We must fight, for example, for the Muslims of China. Mirigul Tursan, a real mother with a real family, was imprisoned in a Chinese re-education camp, tortured, deprived of sleep, and repeatedly subjected to electric shock. Her six-week-old triplets were taken from her, and one died. Why did Chinese authorities do this to an innocent woman and her babies? Because Mirigul is a weaker Muslim who was living in a totalitarian atheist society that targets her version of Islam and any other religion that posits an authority greater than the party or the state. The Chinese communist regime murders and harvests the organs of members of the Falun Gong. It employs violence to transform the religion of Tibetan Buddhism into an arm of the state. It destroys churches whose believers resist the state. And it's attacking Christian public witness by the process of sinicization, indoctrinating the young with the lie that human beings are not created free by God, but are the wards of the party and the state. You and I must fight for Mirigul, her Muslim community, and all the religious minorities of totalitarian China we must also fight for the Christians of Nigeria. Last month, as her, as her helpless father looked on, Deborah Emmanuel Yakubu was stoned, tortured, murdered, and her body burned to ashes by hundreds of her fellow college students who are Muslims. Why did they do this? because they were taught to hate people like Deborah who embrace a faith that they reject. On Pentecost Sunday, scores of Nigerian Catholics were slaughtered while worshiping at, worshiping at mass. Several priests have been murdered since Pentecost. Why are these and other assaults on human dignity increasing in our world? The answer is not climate change. The root cause is a deformed and inhumane hatred of those whose religion is different. 
It's the inevitable, deadly outcome when young people are taught to loathe other human beings whose religious beliefs they reject, or when they are taught to loathe religion itself. Unfortunately, we are seeing in Western democracies themselves a retreat from religious liberty. Many are rejecting particular forms of religion or religion itself. Anti-Semitism continues to raise its vile and violent head in Western democracies. Hatred of Islam and Muslim minorities remains far too prevalent. Both of these threaten democracy itself. In democratic Finland, Paive Rasanen, a member of parliament, has been subjected to criminal prosecution because she openly expressed her Christian beliefs about marriage and sexuality. This is the opposite of pluralism and religious freedom. You'll hear from Ms. Rasanen tomorrow, but she's not alone. In many Western democracies, including in the United States, ancient moral truths on the sacredness of human life, on marriage and sexuality, and on the natural distinctions between men and women are being labeled by those with power as irrational, bigoted, and untrue. But these ancient moral beliefs are neither irrational nor bigoted. They work. That's why they're ancient. They have endured because they represent a view of human nature grounded in faith and reason. Namely, that a person is self-evidently a unity of body and self given by God. On the other hand, the new moral orthodoxy holds that the self, not God, is supreme and that the body is merely an instrument of the self. Well, if that's true, then complete sexual freedom is both rational and desirable, as is the changing of my bodily sex to conform with what my self desires. But what if it isn't true? What if this new moral approach represents a flight from reality, harms children, and leads to suffering and deep unhappiness? In a democracy, everyone has the right to believe what they wish, but no one has the right to silence those who disagree. Unfortunately, that is the stated goal of those in America who are libeling traditional religious believers as haters, as bigots, as racists, even as fascists. Facebook and Twitter routinely cancel believers who post their traditional moral views. At this summit, there are many who have experienced this anti-liberal intolerance. Public school boards have arrogated to themselves the authority to indoctrinate children in the new moral orthodoxy, whether their parents agree or not, and in some cases, even without their knowledge. The current administration has said it will bring the full force of the federal government down on those who do not accept government-imposed moral orthodoxy. Violent attacks on Roman Catholic churches and sacred sites have increased over the past two years and have recently become endemic. This past Sunday, my parish church had an armed guard out front, something I had never imagined could happen, and it should not be happening in America. The American founders feared a state enforced morality as a road to tyranny. They guaranteed the right of religious free exercise for everyone in order to encourage free and equal religious citizens to debate public morality. They were wise to do so because those with traditional moral views have contributed much to our common good and warrant a continuing vigorous voice in this country. The attempt to coerce them, to cancel them, to silence them re represents an impulse worthy of China, not America. Unfortunately, this problem has also entered American foreign policy. The State Department is demanding that nations with trad traditional moral beliefs um, either accept contemporary Western, knowledge, uh, Western views of sexual morality or risk losing U.S. aid 
life-saving aid and life-changing investments. This is the opposite of advancing religious freedom for everyone, everywhere. Pope Francis has rightly called it ideological colonization. It's unworthy of our nation and any nation that purports to defend justice, human dignity, and human freedom for everyone. So let me sum up. Why is religious freedom important? Because it lies at the heart of what it means to be human. Because a society that affords all its citizens full religious freedom generates good things for everyone, including those who disagree. Here's how the summit charter put it, and I quote, full equality of religious freedom for everyone can contribute to social harmony, economic prosperity, political stability, and the lowering of religion-related violence, and dramatically increase international justice, stability, and peace. Not a bad set of reasons, that. So let us stand as one, whatever our religious beliefs, whatever our political beliefs, in fighting for religious freedom, especially those of us blessed to live in free and democratic nations. At this summit, we are men and women of different religious and political convictions, but we are, I trust, united in one cause, the cause of universal human dignity, and its best, most humane, and most powerful defense, religious freedom for everyone, everywhere, all the time. Thank you, and may God bless you all.